Hey, I'm Brendan. Um, you might recognize me a little bit better as a torso with the Jazz Master, but I'm the guy making these videos. I get a lot of questions about my process for making the demos from recording guitars and programming drums to mixing and all that stuff. So I thought it'd be cool to kind of show you what I'm using and walk you through the whole process of making one of these demos. I've been wanting to make this video for a while and then my friend Megan L made a really cool video recently on her process and seeing how like wildly different our processes are inspired me to finally make this. So I'm going to link to Megan's video in the description. If you're not subscribed to her channel, definitely do that because she's making some of the best demos out there, I think. But yeah, let's get right into it. I'm going to give you a little tour of my setup and show you all the gear I'm using, and then we'll kind of start going through the whole process. This is my desk. This is pretty much my whole setup is contained to this wall. I've got my amp over here and the synth set up interface and the load box, some pedal power, here's my pedal storage, a big old shelf that's overflowing. Up above the window I've got this backdrop mounted on just like a curtain rod, <laughs> um, and then I have more colors over here. And here in the back of the room is this, uh, <laughs> what has become the guitar closet. Luckily, it was like the perfect size to fit this stand. So I got all these in here, and then a bunch of random garbage stored. My amp is the Fender Hot Rod Deluxe. Um, the speaker out on that goes into the Two Notes Captor. Um, this is the older version, so I'm just using it as a load box. And then I'm running that right into the SSL2, which is my interface. And then I've been using these Audio-Technica headphones for years. This side of the desk is where I do the top-down stuff. So I've got this like podcast mic stand that I put the camera on. And I keep this Walrus Audio Phoenix here to power anything I need. And then most importantly, I have this Kyle McLaughlin mug. When I get a new pedal to demo, the first thing I always do is spend some time getting to know the pedal. If there are a lot of features and the pedal is more complex, this will obviously take longer. In the case of the demo I'm working on today, it is the Fitty for an Ounce from Dirty Haggard Audio, which is a one knob fuzz. <laughs> so the getting familiar process for this one was not very long, which is cool because I plugged it in and within a few minutes I was already writing a riff that I liked which turned into the song we're going to work on. As far as writing I basically just kind of plug into the pedal and play until I like something. I wish that I had a deeper insight into the writing process than that but I don't. Um, <laughs> once I've written something that I like a lot of the time I'll go into splice and look for drum loops. Sometimes if I find something it'll kind of changed the riff up a little bit which in this case it did um, I had written the riff and then I found a loop and then the rhythm of the riff kind of changed to fit the loop a little bit better I should say right up front that the way I approach making the tracks for these demos is pretty different from the way I would approach making a record um, that's not to say there aren't things you could take away from this and apply to making a record and I definitely have but this process is a lot more streamlined and simplified i'm also trying to make sure that there's a really honest representation of what the pedal sounds like even in the context of the mix i think there's a bit of a misconception that people who make demos are always trying to like fool you into thinking it sounds better than it does or something like that um i know in my case and a lot of other demo artists that's not the case we genuinely want you to hear what the pedal sounds like because that's what our job is <laughs> so back to guitars i am pretty much always plugged from the guitar right into the pedal right into the amp from the speaker out of the amp into the captor which is my load box um, then I go from the captor into the interface and I am running two notes wall of sound plugin for my cab simulation. Um, I really like this plugin a lot. 
One of my go-to settings is this black panel Fender Twin type um, with cream backs. I have that running with a 57 right in the center and then a ribbon mic a little bit off center. I'm going to turn off the wall of sound quickly so that you can hear what the amp sounds like if you just kind of run it without any speaker or speaker simulation straight into the interface um, in case anybody has been curious about that before. So yeah, you can hear why the speaker simulation is pretty necessary. Most of the time I am double tracking guitar parts, always the main track pretty much. And then sometimes the lead parts I won't, which I didn't in this case. I like to keep things pretty simple. So I will pan the double tracked rhythm guitars wide and then I'll leave the lead parts in the middle. So you're getting that melody. I try to go light on any extra processing. For this track, on almost all the guitars, I'm only using an EQ um, as a high pass filter just to cut out some lows to keep from muddying up the mix. Occasionally, I will put a compressor on the guitars. That's kind of more so for if I'm demoing time-based effects or modulations where it's a cleaner signal because I think the compression just kind of helps it sit in the mix better. When I'm doing dirt pedals, I try the majority of the time to keep it without compression just so you're really hearing the way the pedal is responding. Now for bass, I, a lot of the times, will run the same signal chain, so it's actually going through the Hot Rod Deluxe, but sometimes I will put on an impulse response of a bass cabinet. In this case, I decided not to because I kind of like the nastiness of the more direct bass. Um, I thought it just kind of worked for the track, so that is usually just a call I'll make when I'm working on it. Now, for drums, I would say nowadays about 90% of the time I am getting my drums from Splice. In this one, I just searched rock um, and then I'll put in the BPM and kind of poke around until I find a few different loops that I can kind of build the song with. Once I have the loops in, I'll just loop them. Um, <laughs> And then occasionally I will kind of chop up the loops if I need to change up the part, but I couldn't find a sample to do what I wanted. Um, you can see that at the end of this song, I ended up doing that. I'm gonna take off all the plugins on the drums so you can hear what the sample sounded like before I processed it. I like to use this SSL drum strip plugin because it's got compression and EQ. I'm also a huge fan of distortion on drums. Um, I think it just adds a lot of color. And then on this track, I did put some spring reverb on the drums. It almost makes the snare sound like a clap a little bit. You can see that I put the spring reverb first. Um, that was because I really like what the distortion and the compression do after it. I think on its own or at the end of the chain, it just sounds a little weak. And I think the distortion especially kind of brings it to life. In this little bridge section, the loop sounds pretty different, so I decided to kind of distort the hell out of it. Um, the rest of the treatment is the same, but there's just kind of more distortion because why not? The kind of finishing touch I like to put on is 
I'll put some bus compression on the master fader. I use this channel strip plugin for that. It's really light compression, but it's just sort of that glue for the whole track. It's really, really subtle. And then the other thing I put on is fresh air, which I guess is kind of an exciter. It just adds some like really high frequency sparkle um, and it sort of just opens everything up in a really nice way. It can get pretty extreme, so I use it sparingly. much it for the tracks. I just kind of do some balancing after that and then I export. So the next part is filming. It pains me a little bit to admit that I do record all the tracks before I film. With my setup it's so much easier to just kind of mime along to the parts than it is to actually record them live while I'm filming. Um, it's kind of a huge pain in the ass to do it live. Um, <laughs> So yeah, pretty much in all these tracks, I'm miming along. Um, sorry. <laughs> to be honest with filming, it's very much been a learning process for me. Basically, as long as I've had this channel, if you go back and watch the earliest demos, it's pretty rough looking. Um, I really had no clue what was going on. <laughs> so I'm still learning all the time, um, but I, I use this Panasonic GH5 as my camera. This camera does have really good built-in stabilization and slow motion, which makes getting those B-roll shots really easy. So as you can see, I kind of drape the backdrop over just like a TV tray. Um, and I put the pedal on there and then I just sort of like move the camera around and scoot back and forth in my chair um, until I have some cool looking slow motion shots like these. For all the playing shots, I just kind of sit in front of the backdrop. Um, I have the camera right in front of me and a big light up to the right of the camera. Then I have a small light that's on the ground pointing up at the backdrop um, just to add some depth. After the intro track, I have the kind of control rundown segments, um, which are on the desktop, kind of shot top down. So I use this podcast mic stand or broadcast mic stand that I have mounted to the desk and I have a tripod ball head on that so I just mount my camera and point right down I'll tape the pedal down to the desk so it doesn't move the signal chain is exactly the same as the guitars for the track but I'm using even less processing than in the tracks so I just have the impulse responses going so you're hearing straight up guitar pedal amp once everything's filmed, we go to editing. This is another area where I don't really know what I'm doing, but I've sort of just picked up some things along the way. There are probably better ways to do this, so I don't think I would recommend taking my advice on editing. So we'll kind of breeze through. <laughs> Basically, I drop the audio in the main timeline, and then I will just kind of grab a bunch of clips and drop them above that. I use an adjustment layer with some LUTs that I downloaded for free so it looks nice and then for the intro track I just kind of slap some transitions that I also downloaded for free on there. Then once I've edited the intro track I add the captions um, and that's pretty much it. That is kind of the end of the process. I export and then I upload to YouTube and then you get to see it. If you have any other questions for me I'd be happy to answer them in the comments or you can feel free to message me on Instagram. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.